All right. Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Pete Rollick's falling down on the job. What? I'm, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, is eating, you know, smoked beaver meat. Horror author, Lovecraft and author, Mike Minnis on the show today. We'll talk to him in a minute. Uh, I'm Mike Davis, as many of you may just now be realizing after watching the show for five years. Uh, podcaster, publisher, editor, and uh, who are you? The guy that says, you, Kelly Young, who are you? Oh, I'm uh, Kelly Young. I'm the executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. Oh, okay. Matt? I am Matt Carpenter. Uh, Pickman's Gallery by Ulfar Press is still a go. I have a prize for today. Oh, that's Some right. It's upside down. It's upside down. Damn it. Um, Every time. And I can't handle it, okay? <laughs> um, some lucky reader is going to get a paperback copy of the wonderful novella, The Ballad of Black Tom, by Victor Lavalle. Victor really will be on the show in August. Terrific read. Victor will be on the show in August. So, uh, um, Pete. Oh, me? me? Uh, Pete Rollick, yeah. so you don't have to be. Um, Good point. writer, author, editor. Man About Town. I do a mean rendition of um, Putting on the Ritz. But you can't do it right now, unfortunately. Moving on. Hector Plasmic says five years now, and Mike's still not an executive editor. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. Someday. It's, you know, it's good to have a goal to move towards. Uh, Rick. Rick Lay, who was presently surprised to discover that the panel on the Necronomicon Robert E. Howard got nominated for an award by the Robert E. Howard Foundation. Oh, great. Nice. Uh, I'll have Mike introduce himself, but Matt, before we get there, could you, you're the one who introduced me to Mike Menace's work. Can you maybe start this off and then have Mike uh, talk about himself a little bit? Well, sure, because uh, I've got a lot of um, things I've wondered over the years. If uh, you were reading mythos fiction back in the late 90s to the mid 2000s, you couldn't help but come across the name Michael Minnis. Uh, he had work appearing in multiple anthologies and online. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I, I guess we'll delve into that. He's not written for some time now, but these stories still stand up uh, to the best that's ever been written. Uh, so that's how I got into it when I was in about 2003, four, I started going on alt.horror.cthulhu and his name appeared and that's how I got into reading his work. Uh, so things that I understand are you had a background in graphic design and role playing games and that's kind of how you got into Lovecraft. So Mike, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, originally um, with Lovecraft, when D and D came out, I was probably ten or eleven. And oddly enough, when I first picked up the game, I thought, "Oh my God, this is too complicated." I'm I almost basically put it back or sent it back to the store. But then I decided, you know, come on, sit down, break out the rules. Well, when I finally parsed out some of the language. I found out that Halfling and Hobbit were the same thing. They'd done that to avoid uh, further problems with the Tolkien estate at the time. And I thought, I just read The Lord of the Rings, so I thought, oh, I can be a Hobbit in a dungeon. Great. Went with D&D. &D. A few years later, uh, eighth grade, I had a friend recommend reading Lovecraft. And this I think these are the DAW paperbacks, uh, the black and white artwork. I can't think of the artist right now, but I read them. I got hold of the Dreamlands tales first, which are decent, but I don't really think they're his most effective work. But I decided to stick through it, and then I got into the work of the Mythos, which from there I started reading him. But I didn't start writing anything until much later. You're talking from a gap from about, I would say, 15, 17 years. 
So you went to school for graphic design? I went to uh, Bowling Green for fine arts. At the time, um, all we were using were Atari computers for graphic design because the instructor thought they were as good as Max. They weren't. Uh, the computer lab turned out to be nothing more than a giant Petri dish for computer viruses. It just, we had no software for it. And I went back to Washtenaw Community College to actually pursue graphic design. You know, and let me jump in here real quick, Matt, because I just realized that for those listening who don't know who Mike Minnis is, they're probably going, but yeah, but what's the name of his book? Uh, the collection is Your Poison Dreams. Just wanted to shoot that so people can be looking that up by Mike Minnis, Michael Minnis, so people can be looking that up while you're, while you're talking. So, so uh, how do you jump from graphic design to actual writing? Um, what was what was the what was the leap? Well, I think the first inclination that I wanted to at least write something is uh, Mark Twain. Uh, I think Huckleberry Finn, and I think there's a scene where they're uh, searching for treasure. They're digging. Is that the graveyard? Uh, I I'm, remember I'm that uh, like, Tom Sawyer was saying they were ago. robbing a, a pirate treasure, and it was just a yeah. bunch of turnips. Right, and I just kept rereading and rereading that part. I got stuck on the morbid part. When I was a uh, growing up, uh, my favorite painting of all time was uh, the Triumph of Death by uh, Bruegel. Have you ever seen it? It's a depiction of the uh, war and the plagues in medieval Europe. I haven't, no. Yeah, it's a morbid stuff for a morbid kid. <laughs> so anyway, from there, um, I read The Lord of the Rings, uh, Watership Down, All Quiet on the Western Front, etc., and so forth. And eventually I thought much later in life, probably my early 30s there. So I thought, why don't I take a hand at this? Why don't I take a stab at this? And the first story was uh, Evil Gods and Cheap Beer, which I probably haven't looked at in about 20 years. It would almost be like reading a new story to me. Uh, I go back to some of my older material and it feels antique. It there's some purple prose. Um, I can detect styles from other authors in it that disappear later. When I went into news writing and uh, reporting, I learned how to really cut things to the bone. I would have my work go through two editors, and I, you get to sit and watch and watch your story be uh, operated on. But it did help. So, so you were actually in uh, in reporting then? Yes, it was a local startup paper in Toledo, Ohio, which survived for a grand total of six weeks. <laughs> you have to pay the printer. And the other one was a internet news portal called the Metronet. And we were only a staff of three. And when we lost two people they couldn't keep going with just me and that was about a year year and a half and about how old were you at this time well let's see i'd have been 28 30 and is that about when you started writing fiction then mm -hmm. yes okay then how did you uh, move into um uh, was all of your fiction sort of a, a horror bent a lovecraftian kind of bent well, there's been a, a novel called The People's Hair, and that's sort of a uh, grand take on uh, general systems theory, World War II uh, animation, and the effects of propaganda and mythology on uh, 
modern human psyche. I was really blown away by A Clockwork Orange and uh, other works like 1984, which actually turned out to be much more prescient than we ever would have imagined. And I thought, I want to do something along these lines. I want to write a book that seems crazy at first, but when you put all the pieces together, it becomes profound. Um, so what, what turned you to the short subject then? Uh, <clears throat> the short stories, you mean the Lovecraft fiction? Yeah. Well, for one thing, uh, to this day, there's a style and a depth and a weirdness to him. I only think uh, Poe and pros possibly Ligotti come as close to that. Um, I tried to explain it one time online. I just reread At the Mountains of Madness, and they've just fled the Shogoth. Uh, I think they've come back through the, uh, I guess, what, a basilica? And uh, the remains of, I want to say, is it Gedney are there? And he, I've never read something so effective. Lovecraft describes something like running through a nightmare with that dislocation of space and time and a feeling. And he uh, reflects upon the fact that uh, this poor fellow is dead at the bottom of the world, frozen for all eternity, and all he can hope is that nothing disturbs his remains. That was one of the creepiest things I have ever read in my life. I mean, what an ending. You're dead at the bottom of the world forever, you know, frozen in an alien city. You mentioned Ligotti a second ago. Uh, I've got two quotes to read. Um, right, uh, one's from Thomas Ligotti, and he wrote, writing in a style that is equally, equally concise, concise, I can't talk today. I'm getting the flu, I think. That's equally concise and evocative, brutal and poetic. Michael Menace is an expert teller of horror tales that are both delicately nuanced and emotionally powerful. And then Ted Klein says, I've had a chance to read some of Michael Menace's stories and I'm very impressed. He's a tremendously proficient writer. I have no idea whether Menace's work is generally known, but it deserves to be. So that's, that's Ted Klein. Uh, I agree, which is why... We wanted to have you on the show today. Thanks. So, so, so here's a, here's a question I have. It just, and maybe I'm off base because I noticed that um, Cassiopeia Press is, uh, it's it's in Germany, okay. And in 2005, he put out this collection in dual language, um, anencephalus and uh, other poison dreams. Right. Uh, I designed and, the cover. And the. Um, the other half is in German, and you can read it German in one direction and English in another. Um, and so there's like this connection with German publication. I wonder if you could speak to that, and then I had another question about it. Okay. How did um, you end up knowing like a, a German publisher? Lars Menk um, helped me edit The People's Hair. He lives in Berlin, so uh, it was nice having someone right on location to help me make sure that my depictions of wartime Berlin were accurate. He'd also read the Lovecraft stories and he offered to translate into German. And he knew uh, the publisher at Verlag Berenklau and it went from there. There's one story in there, the humorous story that we didn't translate into German because Lars said for the most part that uh, the humor wouldn't translate well into German. Okay, now well, well, this is kind of what I'm getting at. Okay, now, so you said one of the books that really had an impact on you when you were younger was All Quiet on the Western Front. And then you write this uh, nonfiction book, uh, and some of it deals with uh, wartime Germany. Okay, now, if I look at a certain amount of your fiction is rooted in the German experience pre and during World War II. Uh, for example, uh, Knuckerhole, there's some German Luftwaffe pilots that 
a crash in England. Uh, in um, Chartreuse, it's about German soldiers uh, in the long retreat away from the Eastern Front. Uh, and uh, then uh, there was that story about uh, Hitler, uh, or it wasn't really about Hitler, but uh, it was called um, Nakloge, I think. No, no, it was uh, Stumper, Stumper yeah. Gasse 29. Yes. Okay. I got to say, Chartreuse made me think of the book, The Forgotten Soldier. Right. Were, were you familiar with that? Was that deliberate? Or, um, yes, I'd uh, read it previously, and uh, up until that point, I thought All Quiet on the Western Front was the reigning war novel. I know The Forgotten Soldier is nonfiction, but it's related to the reader with the intensity of a short story throughout. And for a novel that the intensity almost becomes unbearable. So when you finish it, uh, you're relieved, you're exhausted mentally. So um, is your background, uh, do you have any links to Germany at all? I was just wondering, was this just an area of fascination? For you? I think this is just an area of interest. I'm not aware of any, relatives or uh, family over in Germany. Um, so for those of you who haven't read it, um, uh, uh, one thing Rick Lay had said, I think before we went on air, that the story Chartreuse, which is uh, in uh, the collection Poison Dreams, available on Kindle, and then this old publication from Germany, uh, it's a King in Yellow story set in uh, World War II as German soldiers are retreating slowly from the Russians and what influences uh, that play may have had upon them. So um, what, can you tell us anything about the writing of that story? It's, it's a brilliant piece of work. Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> it takes place in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, Romania in 1944, uh, Army Group South has basically been routed. And this was an area where uh, a guy, Sayer, who wrote The Forgotten Soldier, was passing through uh, basically Transylvania, which is kind of haunted ground in Romania, the way the uh, Hartz Mountains in Germany are considered witch country. And I like that idea. He said in the retreat, all it seemed he saw were military police and prostitutes. In addition to being strafed by the Red Air Force. Um, what I think fascinates me <clears throat> more about World War II than World War I is World War I seemed to be unavoidable, but World War II was an act of will it was wished into being. And if you follow uh, up until World War I, there had been that sort of Edwardian optimism about man, progress, and civilization. Uh, World War I mortally wounded. That was the uh, bodily injury. World War II, I think, was the one that was the demise of the soul, so to speak. And that's what I was addressing in Chartreuse is that the peril these men in is uh, of their souls. The, the bodies are secondary. And that's why the deaths in uh, Chartreuse, for the most part, are reported so flatly. You know, when a man emerges, a Russian, I should say, emerges from the tank with his hands blown off, and falls dead over the side, it's just reported as if it were a news ticker at the bottom of the screen. And that's what I think the peril of the Yellow King is to the mind and to the heart and not the body. Something was said about Lovecraft once is that, and I don't know if I agree at that, a spiritual terror is absent from his work. It's all very physical very biological, very visceral. 
and m most of the Yellow King stories, uh, you don't get that sense. Um, can we talk? Uh, can there's you, another story that I want to come back to in a second, but because yeah, I think my, Rick has a question. Real okay, quick. I, I wanted to pursue some King and Yellow stuff. You, um, Mike, you sort of. Uh, how, how old is that story? We're looking at a story that's probably about 17 years old. Because I was just looking at it from, uh, we normally have on here Joe Pulver, who is the uh, Robert W. Chambers champion. Uh, at least he champions the writings and he, he writes sex on the stories. And you followed Pulver's rule perhaps before it was conceived, that a king in yellow story should have no Cthulhu mythos references in it and it could just be on chambers alone. Was that conscious on your part? I don't think it was. Um, honestly, like I said, I can't recall, maybe Lovecraft did include something of the king in yellow, but they, the, the mythos and the king touch on each other, but there's no crossover. There's you know, no Venn diagram, so to speak. And in some sense, I did want to skirt, I felt, some of the obvious mistakes I'd made earlier, reference to elder signs, this or that, banging my fist on the keyboard to make... Uh, Aklo appear on the screen, what have you, or some mysterious language. And I wanted to put some distance between me and that, some of the tropes that are endlessly recycled. Um, you mentioned before that you were influenced by All Quiet on the Western Front. Did you read uh, Eric Maria uh, Marquez's um, World War II novel, A Time to Love, A Time to Die? I actually wasn't aware there was a second novel. Yeah, he wrote a World War II. It, it was, I only know about it because it was made into a movie with John Gavin in 1958, which I saw on television, which was pretty decent. So there, there is a uh, – and if you do see the movie version, they actually have the author uh, play a German professor in the movie. That's interesting. Well, I'll let you, you can continue, Matt. Okay, so the next story I wanted to talk about was, okay, it just happened to be a favorite of mine um, from this particular book, which was, this was when uh, Chaosium started branching out into original fiction away from the price model. And they came up with this anthology, Arkham Tales, um, Tales of the Haunted City, uh, they were selected and edited uh, by William Jones, who was uh, big at Elder Sign Press at the time. And uh, you have this story in here called Small Ghost, um, which was really <laughs> a brilliant little story, but it was, it, seemed, it was your take on Brown Jenkin. Yeah, with that story, um, it banks mostly at atmosphere right up to the end, kind of like uh, one of the most effective passages in <clears throat> horror fiction is uh, Poe's opening on the fall of the House of Usher. You know, that dull, dead, soundless day in autumn. That's brilliant. And another example I would think of is, uh, is it Shirley Jackson, The Haunting of Hill House? Uh-huh. And uh, she talks about Katie Did's dreaming. And you have the punch of a novel condensed into a paragraph. She almost didn't have to write the book after that paragraph. I wanted that kind of condensed uh, magnitude in what I write. And that's why I wanted to put more or less everything off to the very end. It's the uh, proverbial creepy story that turns out to be true at the end. And I knew I'm kind of working with a well-chewed trope at this point. So let's see if I can play up the atmosphere 
and the dread and uh, some of the old world superstition and fear in a rundown part of Arkham. Well, like I said, I think it was the highlight of the, of the book. Um, so then um, another story that uh, is in your uh, newer publication, it's also in, um, I think, uh, Anencephalus, um, is Snuff Movie. And yeah, great story. Thank you. It, it's, it's bloody brilliant. So I was wondering if you could tell us about that. Like those... With the characters, before we even get into the actual telling of the story, the characters being so into these particular strange videos, they were like they were like vividly coming to life off the page. I was wondering if they were modeled on anybody you knew. Well, um, the location is modeled on Toledo, Ohio. Uh, the gas station with the graveyard overlooking it exists. It's a wonderful view for the afterlife, by the way. Uh, so is the diner. The, the diner exists, the unnamed one. Uh, off of people, generally when I model off of people, they become a composite of several characters, several people in life I know. And people wonder why a lot of the time I'm not much of a talker at all in public or in work. And that's because generally by and way I'm observing people. Uh, taking notes on their physical characteristics, their mannerisms, uh, listening to the way they talk, because from there, I have a template to use in a, for characters, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, something that was said about Lovecraft once is that characters were not really his strong point or characterization. I'm on the fence about that. But then someone pointed it out, and I think it might have been Stephen King, is that in all the million words or whatever he wrote, there are something like only a few thousand lines of dialogue for the most part, actual speaking parts. Yeah, that's a good point. And there are the times when he did try to render phonetic language, and uh, it it's, I don't want to say it's a train wreck, but when you get into the uh, Dunwich Horror, and I think one of the uh, local boys is talking about finding the footprints, which to me, very creepy element of the story. There's something huge walking around. You can't see it. You just see where it smashed through the trees on its way to do whatever it's doing. And it's rendered in uh, his take on the way someone in New England would speak. And it's like driving down a bumpy road in a car with your head bouncing off the roof. And I do understand it's important to include mannerisms, inflection, and whatnot. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's coherence and lucidity that matter. Uh, like I said, the characters, when it's uh, the I guy talking, so to speak, that is me to a certain extent. I mean, and I've heard of a story once too where, and this was Stephen King again, he said the most effective opening line he ever saw in a story was, this is what happened. I've heard that and I, I thought you were gonna say that, yeah. Yeah, uh, you are compelled to read at this point. The right. guy has your ear, you're sitting with him, maybe you're sharing drinks, but right to the point. Someone, please correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, you too, but I think it's actually the opening line to one of Stephen King's stories. I think it's the opening line to The Mist, but I, I this old brain, I definitely could be wrong. Um, yeah, I haven't read The Mist in a long time. Listen, I told you this before we went live, but I want to I tell you on air that I think Snuff Film is not only a really great you know, in a sense, Lovecraftian story, but it, I think it's a, one of the very best horror short stories that I've ever read. Um, Thanks. It's Snuff Movie, Mike. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, Snuff Movie. I, I beg your pardon. Um, you know, and 
I really encourage everyone listening to read it. And the other thing I want to say about this story, and then I'll let Matt and Matt continue, uh, is one of the many things that I like about it is this sense of that you give of there's this there's this hidden world behind the world. You know what I mean? There's these people on on corners and at bus stops and so forth that they may or may not be part of some hidden network or it may be totally, you know, the protagonist's imagination. You just don't know. Um, I really like that sense of the, the, you know, that there's this hidden world. The right, other thing no. that really stood out to me <clears throat> was the, the final scene, which I won't spoil, but where he's in his apartment. I mean, I wouldn't want to read that story at 2 a.m., you know, by myself in the dark, because that's very compelling, very scary story, Mike. That's based on a friend's apartment and uh, the view from his kitchen at night and whatnot. It was in a dicey part of town, so you would see people walking about or doing things at odd hours and whatnot. Old building, a lot of odd noises and whatnot, comings and goings, et cetera, and so forth. And I'm one that I've never enjoyed that kind of life. I don't like being, having people stacked above, below, and to either side of me. It's, it's like a dog kennel. It's, you know, people barking at each other all day. <laughs> so I see your point. Uh, I just have one comment. Um, Mike, the, uh, have you ever read a story by Henry Cutner called The Shadow on the Screen? No, but I've heard of Cutner. That's one of my favorites too, Rick. It, what it, what was interesting this so you, you, every time you do something, I just give it a writer. Every time I think I do something original, I find it's somebody who sort of anticipated me. And uh, Shadow on the Screen, which was written in the late '30s, is it's a uh, more Lovecraft in a story than a mythos story, and it doesn't do any name dropping. But it plays around with a concept that was then becoming cliched of the crazy movie director and a movie director wants to, for his own enjoyment, film a series of sacrifices to a Lovecraftian God, anticipates the concept of a snuff movie um, somewhat. But you can find that online, it's on Wikisource. But you might find that amusing. Sure. Well, well another thing I was wondering uh, after reading that story, is uh, did you have a particular interest in uh, horror film? Uh, with me, I'm extremely picky with horror because, uh, for one thing, I can't imagine a more easier film to bang out than a horror movie, especially these days when uh, you just line up a number of anonymous victims to be taken out one by one. With horror film... Uh, I think the really great works are uh, would be The Shining, a particularly disturbing atmosphere, uh, that yodeling at the beginning or you know throat singing by Rachel Alkin. Still, when it was a uh, trailers were being shown in 1980, 81. If you wanted me to leave the room, just run the trailer of The Shining, and I would flee. Uh, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, the other one would be The Thing, which is a brilliant exercise in paranoia. Uh, for years, and when I would come across a d true film with uh, about Lovecraft, a horror, uh, they were almost all poor. In quality, I mean, you had the curse. Um, you had the actual Dunwich Horror made in 1970, which is a bit of a joke. Uh, Can I just comment that sure. nowadays, uh, what they do is they show it live with a live cast on stage acting it out and uh, audience participation, and they call it the Dunwich Horror Picture Show. <laughs> I th didn't they do the Call of Cthulhu black and white? Uh, yes, that was a, a, a loving depiction by the HP Historical Society. Yeah. Right. They also it did really, a great job on the Whisperer. It really worked. Um, I know, I think Guillermo 
De Toro. I hope I didn't maul his name too badly. Uh, he was working on the Mountains of Madness. But uh, that interesting uh, thing about him, <clears throat> that rumor's been going around for a long time, and because he wanted an R-rated at the Mountains of Madness, uh, that's supposedly why he was turned down. And I, that's probably all true. Now, now that he's won uh, an Academy Award for The Shape of Water, now you see talk on the internet of, you know, can't we get, now that he's got more... Uh, influence let's say let and he loves lovecraft so much let's get him to do at the mountains of madness i think he could do a great job at the mountains of madness but i also think there's several directors who could you know many more who could not but he's definitely not the only one is he still interested knowing him know. from what i hear of him he probably is if somebody handed him the money he'd probably do it but i don't know the man personally but from everything i hear and Everyone is put off by the idea of an R-rated horror movie. I I'm missing something here. How does yeah, that? Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's not that they're put off by it. It's that the bankers are. Uh, he came up with this concept art, and I think he did some presentations. I think the rumor has it. He had Tom Cruise lined up to play the lead, of all people. Well, Tom Cruise does a good job in science fiction. Okay. Uh, but then... When yeah, like the mummy. It was going to be R-rated. Oh yeah, the mummy. <laughs> well, you know, like Minority Report. I'm kidding you. Yeah, Minority well, Report's good. Well, so when it came, they think like if you make a movie and it's R-rated and you don't get the audience for teenagers, they're thinking that you're not going to have good box office. Is I'm pretty much thinking. So they probably, I think that's why they put the squash on it. Well, Deadpool sure did okay. And it's an R-rated comic book movie. Yeah, well, anecdote about R-rated movies. My cousin and one of my friends, we went to see, uh, I think, the second Rambo, which I think is R-rated. I, I don't know if the first one is. And lo and behold, we're turned back at the ticket gate. But, you know, teenagers were griping about how unfair the world is, et cetera, and so forth. Well, here comes a guy walking up he's going to go see Rambo too. He's a little tipsy and he says, what are you walking away for? And well, we can't get in to see the movie. We don't have a legal guard. And he says, the hell with it. I'm your legal guardian. Follow me. <laughs> That's he comes great. Walking back. The guy at the ticket booth just stares at us and he says, they're all with me. Give them tickets. And so I think, yeah, teenagers, they're going to find a way to see the movie. That's true. That's true. They'll find a way to see a movie they want to see. Isn't that right, uh, Pete? My concern is I sincerely doubt they're going to go with the original 30s setting. I mean, if they did, I would be surprised. If I they, would hope that they did. If they don't, then they're going to have a hard time explaining how the greatest mountain range in the world has evaded all detection for, what, 75, 80 years? Yeah, they'd have, they'd have to come up with a lot of uh, little tricks. Pete, do you think teenagers will do anything to go see a movie they want to see? Teenagers will steal their grandmother's car to go see a movie. <laughs> There's yeah, a story behind this. Grandmother mic. in it. <laughs> so, yes, they what, will what do I, anything to go see a movie they want to see. When I was in the '70s, I was born in 1955. Uh, you could get into probably pretty much any R-rated movie if you were tall enough to pass for 16, and I was pretty tall. Then, I got uh, turned back so many times. Unless it, unless it had sex as an object. I think it was some movie called Seven Minutes or something like that, 16 Minutes, some, some movie like that. We couldn't, we couldn't uh, sneak into an R-rated film, but we got into every other R-rated movie. So, summer of 42. I mean, the only thing I remember where I definitely had to be the age was when we went to see Last Tango in Paris. Well, that was x ray. Yeah, so they, they definitely had that they were definitely checking for, and I was luckily of the age limit then. So, so Mike, I, I guess what I'm curious about then is so we've got this um, sequence of stories, uh, which are all very good and thoughtful 
and well written, fairly original. And uh, then suddenly the spigot turns off. What happened that you stopped writing? Well, at one point, I was encouraged to write a uh, non mythos story. The last one was Gordy Graham Gets His Apocalypse. And I like the idea of a lot of people like zombie movies. It seems to be more or less a uh, national pastime now. This story was written pretty well before The Walking Dead. So if you see me referencing uh, walkers and runners in there, uh, I wasn't aware of the term at the time. But after that, I wrote it, polished, finished it, felt it was one of my best works, uh, really in no way, shape, or form related to the mythos. At this time, I was also working on my second novel, which is The Last Confederate Freak Show. So I became tied up in that for quite a while. Uh, novels are enormously time-consuming and labor-intensive. Uh, about 2009, my mother became ill, passed away in 2012, uh, cancer, the usual suspect. And that took me away from writing for quite a long time. I was discovered again by Harkson, and we put together a collection as of now, I would say I have about a total of 40 stories, and I would say at least half have never seen the light of day. So we're in the works to put a second collection together. Okay, so I'm saying second collection. Yes. What's the first, the one that you it's, just It's uh, out on Lulu Press. It's called The Girl Who Walked in Circles. I see. Mm-hmm. And he put together. And then, of course, you got the collection, Your Poison Dreams, as well. Yes. Right. Which, by the way, I have to say to everyone listening, I, I don't see this on print on my screen. Maybe it is in print. But on Kindle, it's $2.34. You've got no excuse not to own this thing. It's, it's brilliant writing and it's a steal. So buy it, definitely. Matt, so, you have any more questions for me? Well, I, was, I was wondering, like, so uh, this uh, person, um, Harkson, how'd they discover you? Or uh, this is um, uh, H. Harkson. He wrote, he's uh, had a couple of publications in Mythos, but I haven't seen anything else for a while yet. And this just was, this just recently came out in the last couple of months, right? Mm hmm. Uh, so, how did, he, how, did, how did you all get back in touch for the publishing? Because I was afraid you were completely done. Yeah, it was via Facebook. I mean, yeah, technically for a while I was gone there. And I know Ramsey Campbell more or less said the same thing, is that he felt he'd said everything he could in the mythos. And I was approaching a point where I thought, God help me, I don't want to start recycling the same stories over and over again with just uh, different settings, characters, and possibly dialogue. Uh, horror, unfortunately, has a very limited language, and it is very easy to repeat yourself. You know, besides The Witch, Pete and I have discussed this, that everyone's different. Just because you write a, a, a few stories, or 40 stories, or five stories, or two novels, that doesn't mean you have to continue to write the rest of your life if you don't want to. Maybe you've said not you, Mike, but just speaking in general, said as much as you want to say and you're done. You know, there's no rule that you have to keep writing. That said, if you ever need a publisher, Mike, I hope you'll consider emailing me when you're looking around for one because I love your work. Thanks. And there's always the possibility, and it's probably likely at this point because being published again is encouraging uh, that I would resume writing in that vein again. I mean, I just got done with a children's novel, and uh, it's going through the proofs at Lulu Press and whatnot, and it's a case of uh, hammering all the little bumps out in the carpet that after reading a manuscript several times over, someone new looks at it, and they pick out an error, jumps right off the page that you somehow managed to be blind to, 
after several readings. So I have that going on. And it seemed like, if I remember, a Mythos Fiction kind of crumpled up there for a while. It went off the rails. There was a Sandy Peterson passed away. Uh, didn't a few publishers fold? No, Sandy Peterson's still very much alive. Um, oh, uh, 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 sorry, Sandy. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Herbert. I'll tell who, Sandy he's dead. Uh, who was like, the guy? Uh, Jim, Davis, Jim Davis died. He was uh, executive editor, I think, at Arkham House Books for a while. I think, was it Jim Taylor or Jim Davis? Uh, and I know that um, the guy who ran, Dave Wynn, who ran Mythos Books, disappeared. And uh, uh, Lindisfarne Press went bankrupt about that time. And uh, Elder yeah. Sign Press kind of went out of business, too. That's what I'm talking about. We hit the but, ice. But the thing is, in this business, Honestly, since 2010, it's been a volcano of publication. You cannot keep up. One person can no longer keep up. Yeah, There are multiple small presses going, uh, multiple venues, online venues, uh, submission anthologies, open submission anthologies. You wouldn't believe it. It's like everyone's cash cows. If you put Cthulhu on it, it sells a mint. Mm -hmm. Matt, Matt, I think he was thinking James Turner, I think was the Yeah, author. James Turner. Sorry, that's the guy. Yeah. And, and also Necro guys. Necronomicon Press temporarily. I mean, it's back now. Yeah. And then that Keith went, that went out the Keith same Herbert time. died. That's who I meant, Keith Herbert. <clears throat> mm. You know, when I started reading Lovecraftian fiction, it was a it was a case of finding it all so you could read it. And now it's more of a case of there's so much that you're just you're looking for the gems because there's some there's there's a lot being published and there's a lot of crap being published too you know e so. e even if you keep to the good stuff there's too much to read that's very true um so, wait, so could you tell me you said you finished a second novel you had your first novel and then a second novel you said you got finished with yes um that's currently with an agent uh the people's hair is currently off the market. It's back in my hands. It just wasn't selling enough copies to uh, justify the paperwork done in uh, keeping up with receipts, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, last Confederate sh freak show concerns a uh, traveling freak show caught up in John Hood's invasion of Tennessee and Kentucky in the last months of the Civil War. Oh, what a horrible time that was. <laughs> oh, yes, my actually, God. Um, Battle of Franklin and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Franklin, apparently they've done statistical analysis of uh, casualties, et cetera, and so forth, and said you had a better chance of surviving Omaha Beach than you did uh, Franklin as a Confederate soldier. Well, you'll be happy to know that the battlefield of Franklin is now saved for all time is a parking lot for the Pizza Hut. Oh, good. Great. It's important to preserve history. Yeah. Yeah, it's under there. You just yeah. have to, you know. It's you know, overall, I guess. Yeah. Can I get back to Snuff Movie for just a second? Because I sure. forgot to ask you this. Uh, are you familiar with the term creepypasta? I wasn't until much later. Yeah. Afterward. But yes, I know what about creepypasta. I'm not saying your work reminds me of creepy pasta, but I am saying that, uh, and I mean it as a compliment, because there's some very, very good creepy pasta out there. So a lot, is there if anything else? There's a lot of junk too. But uh, I don't know. It's just me. But I think the best creepy pasta almost makes you feel like this could happen, and right. I get that feeling from snuff movie. You know. Uh, Anyway, I'll stop harping on Snuff Movie, well, but it's great. Mainly great, because, great story. Uh, Snuff Movie is all about dancing about the very edge right. of the situation. Uh, it's It does owe a little, I think, to the monkey's paw, where the horror of it all is barely averted. And one of the best lines in horror fiction is, I think he says, for God's sake, don't let it in. Because whatever is out there is his son after he's been chewed up in a massive, I think, factory accident. And it, it's like every nightmare we've ever had uh, where something's at a door 
and we've either got to brace it shut or we have to open it. A lot of my nightmares, oddly enough, I never see what is either with me or after me, but I'm in a space I know that is occupied by something else besides me. Uh, and it, it never resolves. It never plays out. Which makes it even scarier because... Oh, yes, I wake yeah. up. And, you once, know, once you know what the horror is, as horrifying as it may be... And surprisingly, you know. ordinary settings, for the mm. most part. I mean, uh, they don't even bother with a basement or a cellar in my dreams. They just stick me in a living room, et cetera, and so forth, or a space I might recognize... And I think that's where snuff movie really works is it's the space we all recognize the diner, the gas station, the cemetery. We pass by without a second thought during the day, but at night we get a little uneasy. Yeah. Matt, so, do you have any more questions for me? No, I, just kick, um, <laughs> I was really sorry that uh, it seemed after 2005, I'd never see any of your work again. The fact that you've got this publication on Lulu, it, it's, I've read a, a third of the stories in there. I'm, I just ordered it. It means there's going to be a bunch of new menace fiction that I get to read, that you may publish a second volume with them. That's great. And that we might have a, a novel coming out, and you might even think about start writing again. That's uh, all terrific news for us. Sure. You know, I've, I've said, and I think plenty of people have said this, that there are – a lot of talented uh, writers. There are some. There are some very talented writers that not very many people have heard of, and you're one of those. And hopefully, in some small way, we can correct that today. I know. I know a lot of people have heard had heard it'll of you. Help. Yeah, I'm sure it'll help. Uh, no, I, it's just I really you know, great writing. The, uh, the, what the monkey what, the Cabot story is. It, really struck home with me the prodigies of monk phil cabot yeah mm. I, I was going to bring that up too has that been reprinted anywhere in uh yes it probably will um all right the cat is after the microphone here hold on you you can still get eldritch blue it's available yes you still can pete uh, why did that strike home for you yeah, the funny thing with Linda's Foreign Press is they were going to publish a collection of my work before they went under. That was going to be the Omnibus collection. They were going to do a lot of things, but we won't go there. <laughs> Pete? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know why that struck home with me. It just did. Um, I was in this sort of asneth weight phase and somehow that made it into that that mindset and, and go ahead go ahead Rick let's say it's a prequel to the thing on the doorstep and yeah uses as in its weight very effectively yeah it does right. and I, I, th I yeah and you know I it probably was when I was doing research for the weird company um, and I thought it was a really good good prequel story to what was going on in uh, the thing on the doorstep uh, and something that hadn't been done with the character before and something that I needed to be aware of as I was dealing with that character. And, and it really does do a good job. Thanks. That is one of the oldest stories. That one's probably 20 years old. So for those of you who can go on to the easing web page on Facebook, the public message board, uh, there are lists of Mr. Menace's fiction and available publications. Uh, Mike, besides Lovecraft, you also passed Steve Clark Ashton Smith in a story called The Butcher of, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing this right, Voynes? I think it's Vion. The own okay, knowing that my French is horrible. Uh, that is in a rare, rare book. You'll have a hard time getting that one. Well, it's in. It got republished. I've got it in. 
I got that book. Lost Worlds of Space and Time, but it was first in a very rare book called The Sorcerer's Apprentices, which I have not been able to find. So it's been published at least twice. But I would say, what, uh, what drew you to Smith and um, how do you find him, past teaching him different from past teaching Lovecraft? Uh, Smith, for one thing, is, I think, a much more grounded and earthy author than Lovecraft is, for the most part. Um, I do like the purple prose, so to speak. It is distinctly different from Lovecraft. I mean, Lovecraft in his later years was a uh, very straightforward, almost uh, a reporter of events. But I did like the fact that uh, Clark Ashton Smith did go in his uh, own direction. I think one of my favorite stories by him was the Colossus of Lernia. Yeah. Right. Very good stuff. He was closer, I think, in some ways to the uh, Pulp Fiction tradition in some respects with your, you know, your necromancers. He did have heroic characters. It didn't always end in a sort of existential dread for the reader and the protagonist. Uh, you, one of the stories in uh, Poison Dreams is um, the rule of monsters. Right. When you talk about proto shogas. Um, yeah, isn't it a uh, proto shogas? Wasn't that one or two lines dropped by Lovecraft? And I don't know if it was ever taken up again. It was never taken up by Lovecraft. It's like Tolkien with his uh, hobgoblins and ogres. They're mentioned once in The Hobbit, and that's it. So there's kind of that fascination of what is this? It's the white space on the map. And at the time, I was uh, researching uh, kind of prepper, survivalist, uh, conspiracy theorist, and whatnot. And one thing I always try to do to ground a lot of my stories is have the uh, what seems unintentional humor on the part of characters and whatnot. I mean, at the end, we have uh, the... Uh, a crackpot, I don't remember the character's name anymore, going about with his video camera explaining everything. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how can I undercut this all and make it seem realistic? The, geek. the battery, his battery's running low. You see him say, well, great. That's just great. You know, he's revealing cosmic horror and then the video camera decides <laughs> to cut out. Right. So he has to rush through to the end. It was Zeke the, Zeke the Geek, by the way. Yeah, I Zeke I the Geek. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed that story very much also. But I'd also read uh, an account of an engineer who'd, in prepping for a uh, nuclear war, had built his own underground bunker. It was with a bucket and shovel. It was, at the end, about a good three or four levels, uh, secret entrances. They found two entrances, uh, disarmed the traps in them, I mean, the guy was taking his D&D &D game to the limit. They have never found the third passage. But he had uh, shafts, rooms. They came out, uh, I think the Pentagon experts and whatnot came out to examine it and said he probably would have withstood a close-range air burst. And he knew what he was doing. And yeah. all I could think is a bucket and a shovel. Wow. And, you know, time for the most part. Well, now we all want to buy that house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have any more questions for Mike before we let him go? Uh, I just wanted to make one comment. Just, sure. Uh, uh, just as uh, this is in line with like the Henry Cutner one. When, when I was, uh, you know, I try to find sources that Lovecraft may have taken from other stories that we overlook in Weird Tales. He may have gotten his idea for the Shugas 
from a story that um, Belknap Long wrote called The Man with a Thousand Legs, which is about a scientist who injects him with who injects himself with some serum that turns him into this kind of shape-shifting blob. And uh, if if my theory is correct, then Mike has inadvertently gone back to the source for the Chagas when writing this story, because he used a very similar concept. Right. Um, I always took the idea that the proto Shogoths were, and like I said, it's open to interpretation that there was a more human element to them or a somewhat more set form than with what came later. Yeah. Sort of like a prototype before we settled on the final design. Yeah, well, it can mean anything anybody wants. Right. I think I the call. Go ahead, Rick. I'm sorry. I think the Colo Casulu game had a, a scenario in an early volume called the Asylum. Yeah, right. and the Proto Shagoth was actually a kick-ass, you know, party killer. I should have seen the ending for Rules of Monsters. The Rule of Monsters is that title, right? Right. Coming, yeah. but but uh, but I didn't. Another great story. Well, so. one thing I found was Mike even. Since I knew history, that Vienna story, I knew what the little twist was very early on. But it was still fascinating, even though I knew where we were headed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been great. Um, so, again... Your collections are the one I've the one I've read is your Poison Dreams, and mm. there's a Kindle version on on Amazon. But there's what's your other work out there for people to look up? Um, that would be the Girl Who Walked in Circles, right? And uh, right now with Harkson, and I think he's interested. I would like to get the rest of the fiction out to the public. Like I said, there have to be at least fifteen stories or so that. Uh, have been just sitting on a hard drive. They haven't gone anywhere. Well, if you don't have any luck, I hope you'll uh, shoot me an email. And if you do have luck and get it published by someone else, email me and I will let everyone sure. know about it. So when it comes out. And Lulu is the place to find the girl who walked in. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. It was really great talking with you. Appreciate it. All right. Everyone, you have a good night. You too. Well, you Thanks a lot, Mike. Bye. Um, made some changes to the Patreon lately. Um, just real quick. $5 a month, of course, you get to hear all these uh, extra podcasts. The latest one was with uh, Laird Barron and Philip Fricassi and me talking about crime fiction and a little bit about how it relates to horror fiction and a lot more. Um ten dollars a month uh you get all the lovecraft easy and kindle books for free uh editions on kindle for free so and any new ones that come out as they come out i'll give them to you for free uh twenty five dollars a month you get a free print book um as long as you're a member so i think that's a pretty good deal start off with the um lovecraft easy and press books and also, at the same time, try to do my best to not send people books that they already have. So I'll try to communicate my best with that. Then, of course, the $50 a month, in all of these, you get the previous or the awards at the previous level. $50 a month, you can be a guest panelist on the show, and I've got several people who do that from time to time. So uh, just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon. Um, you know, keep me going. This is my only job, and I love it, but it it does take money. So, so all of you out there who are patrons, thank you very much. So Kelly, Oh, the stand hundred, hundred dollars a month. Kelly young, come give you a hand job. <laughs> as long as you're a member <laughs> or have a member. The yeah, very first is, comments out of show. on the show family today. Family show. Family, family the very show. first comments from you on the show today are X rated. Happy Easter fools, everybody. <laughs> 
<laughs> Make yourself useful and talk about the stand. Um. I, oh, I just thought it was interesting that it was just now, you know, geez, the stand has been talked about forever that they were going to remake it. Um, a while ago, Ben Affleck was tapped and he was going to be directing it and he wanted to turn it into a, a three hour movie. And then Josh Boone, who is the writer director of the new, um, the new mutants movie, which looks like a kind of groovy horror film. He was tapped to do it. And he came out and said it was going to come out as four films. Well, now it has been announced that it is going to be an eight part or maybe 10 part series on C CBS all access. And now I'm like, yeah, God, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how the CBS all access works, but I assume that they um, pay attention to their TV restrictions. And I, I feel like the problem with the original the stand miniseries was that it had to kind of follow television restrictions and, and this is a film that should be r-rated it should be really scary and it should be really disturbing my, my so, big problem with this is you have to pay extra money to get cbs all access so i, I have cable I, I get cbs and i don't get all access so i've not get, gotten to watch the new star trek you're, of course, you enough. have an AOL email address too. So yeah, there's no way, there's no way in hell I'm going to pay extra money for more CBS. That's a really good point, though. You know, if if you don't have cable and you're like me and you got Hulu, Amazon Prime, and Netflix, then CBS All Access is basically now becoming another show to consider. But Kelly's point is really well made. That to Kelly's point about. You, nothing R-rated is going to be allowed on this. Well, I don't know like it that. Would be on Netflix. I don't know that, and maybe the problem that Matt is dealing with is that it says CBS in the name. What if it was just called All Access and it was another cable channel that you had to pay for? Well, why is it not with the rest of my cable channels? More money. It's like I already pay, It's like I feel like I pay too much already. You do. Why don't, get they, rid just, of your why cable? don't they just come and like pay me to watch their shows? Why don't you get rid of cable? That's all you think. We we well, all pay. Wages. When I as soon as I get rid of my email address, I'll think about getting rid of cable. So oh, Kelly, I'm, yeah, here's. I don't watch CBS now. I don't watch CBS. Period. No. I, I, you know. So what you're basically telling me is CBS is you know makes television shows. Puts the well, crappy that ones. Is, on, pay, that puts is the crappy question. ones on. on public television and then saves the other ones, you know, for an extra fee. Well, that's my question. I, I have no idea, um, having not dealt with the CBS All Access, if it acts as its own premium cable channel that does not have to follow TV standards as far as the rules go and whether they can swear or what they can show. Yeah, but so I, I don't know if any of that works. And it, it, if that's if that is in fact different, then this might be a fine place for it to live because I think that it, uh, a really interesting thing was done with Hulu and 112263. So I'm all for these kind of things being built on, as eight or 10 part series. Yeah. Not, not having seen the Hulu, Hulu uh, 1963 adaptation, was that R rated or? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Uh, I felt pretty adult, though. I think there was some there was some swearing in it, and there was there were a couple of gore moments that were a little surprising. But also, that book was not necessarily a horror book, whereas The Stand definitely is. And your test right now, which is Star Trek Discovery on CBS All Access, um, obviously there's no R-rated needs there. No, and but what I've heard is that people love Star Trek Discovery. So it's very violent. I'll say that. Really? Okay. More than I stopped longer. after two episodes. I, maybe I should. I, I don't know. Try it again. I don't. Is there anything else that is CBS All Access only? There probably is, but you don't know it. I yeah, it doesn't been... seem worth the money to. Yeah. They have some other TV series on there. They have at least one, but it didn't, it wasn't memorable. You know, I've occasionally gotten other channels and I do it through Amazon. What I do is, is, is like channels like HBO 
or uh, I can't think of any other examples. Uh, Star Z, maybe. Stars, yeah, that kind of thing. They're available through Amazon as channels, and you can pay, you know, ten bucks a month or whatever it is for each one to uh, to view everything that they have. You know, just streaming on your own time, whatever. Which I think is kind of a neat thing. But if CBS All Access. It's a really good point, Kelly. Is it gonna? Is it going to be TV rules or streaming rules? You know. And really, is it even going to happen? This thing has been talked about for the last six or seven years, and it has changed hands so many times. And to be honest, you know, I didn't love the Stand miniseries, but it was made. And, you know, I'd, I'd much rather see a series of The Talisman or something like that that we haven't seen already. Yeah. Uh, speaking of TV series... Uh, the X-Files season 11, the non-arc episodes, for the most part, with, an, with one exception at least, were, I thought, really good. You know, The Lost Art of Forehead Sweat was fantastic. Um, and then you get Chris Carter writing again in the season finale, and it all goes to shit again. I haven't I mean, seen that season finale yet. I, I imagine it ties oh, back God. into... Uh, to the the shocker we learned at the beginning of the season. Not only that, but it's just, it's not even well written. It's terribly written. Hmm. You know, there's a bunch of chase scenes and nothing really seems to happen, except it, there's a lot of fluff in it. Have you seen it, Rick? No. Okay, well, I just saved you guys an hour. I so. will I will recommend something else though. All right. Even though it's not necessarily Lovecraftian, Agents of Shield is really up to its game. Well, it doesn't have to be Lovecraftian for us to talk about it on the show. Right. Have you been watching Agents of Shield, Kelly? Yeah, I in fact I just watched this last episode <laughs> this morning and I was very happy with it. And they are resolving almost every loose end. Well, I think that's a necessity because it is up in the air and whether it'll be renewed right. for another season, which is a bummer because this has been a really strong season. Right. And I just hope I know there's one thing they haven't resolved yet. I'll just say it involves somebody on on the bottom of a watery uh, a body of water. That's the one thing I'm looking for them to resolve. This is season five, right? I think this is four. This is five. It is five. Okay. Yeah, I think I've watched the like the first half of season four, and the re I haven't seen it since then. So one of these days, I'll binge watch everything that I haven't seen on Netflix. Uh, until this is, ends, four was their best season. Five may eclipse it, but four, especially the bottom, uh, the third arc in that. Oh, four was the um, the alternate Hydra world. The mainframe. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was that was incredible. That was amazing. Okay, and, I guess I need to watch it. And we did get Supernatural with Ghost Rider. Yeah, they did a very creative way of they they had their budget cut because of the Inhumans, and I don't know if you noticed, but. The, the space station they were on in the first arc, that's really field headquarters made up to be a space station. Yeah, they've, they're, they're shooting all on the, in the same warehouse and just dressing up the sets differently. But that's been a long history of uh, television. Yeah. You know, when you get, like, I, I remember I got the Wild Wild West on uh, video, and I suddenly realized that all the bad guys had the same headquarters. <laughs> I mean, as far as in, you know, they just changed where the torches were, right? Or the lanterns, or you know, however, however it was lit. It was the same underground cave. But I, 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 when I was a kid, I never noticed this. Sure. So, what about the terror? Who has seen the two episodes of the terror? Isabel oh, won't let me watch it. So I thought I... they took us to bed. What? What do you mean, Isabel won't let you watch it? She doesn't like scary stuff. She, she barely. Doesn't have, she doesn't have to watch it. 
So I'm just going to sit out there by myself and watch it. What if I get scared? <laughs> You've got my phone number. I'll talk you through it. Do you need me to come over and hold your hand? <laughs> Evidently, I need Kelly to. Oh. Kelly, did you like... $100 level will get you there, Matthew. Oh, God. I apologize to everyone <laughs> listening for, for my colleague, Kelly Young. Uh, did you like the terror? Man, yeah, I did. Um, the Terror is maybe my second favorite Dan Simmons novel, and I was really, really looking forward to this. And I just like historical horror anyway is why I was interested in The Alienist and any of the, any of the short stories by the people we like that, that kind of go back into the historical stuff. And The Terror is one of those books that was researched so heavily and so beautifully, and, and I was so enthralled with it when I read it that I – I kind of was obsessed by the whole Francis Crozier and John Franklin expedition. And so I went and bought a ton of books on that stuff back then. And, and then realized that I had, I already knew everything I was reading in these books based on Dan Simmons book, except for the supernatural elements that he added. That, that those expeditions were uh, are taken in the 19th century. Was am I correct? Yeah. In the 1840s, they were trying to find the Northwest passage. Yeah, I wonder and if we could... go ahead. It, oh, it, it's just it was a doomed expedition. Everything oh, yeah. that could go wrong did go wrong. I wonder if we could get Dan Simmons on the show uh, sometime. I'll have to email him and see if he will. He uh, seems like a pretty down to earth guy. I've yeah, got, he does. He does. I've, I've met him a couple of times, and I've got my my copy of the terror signed and summer of night, which is my absolute favorite book by him. I was going to say, I would love to see, I've read summer of night probably four times and I would love to see a mini series summer of night. Yeah, I would too. It, it's so good. I, in fact, I would submit that anyone who has been um, brought, brought up in all of this it and stranger things stuff, you would do yourself a service by, by reading Summer of Night, which is along those same lines, better than Stranger Things, uh, right up there with It and Boy's Life for me. I was going to say, you got to throw Boy's Life in there by Robert R. McCammon. Yeah. One of the best books ever written, period. McCammon now being the most underrated writer to film person ever, because you know now that they're doing Dan Simmons stuff, why haven't we seen boy's life or stinger or something like that something from a cannon as a film you don't want to make boy's life a film you want to make boy's life a miniseries because you know you think about boy's life each it's almost as if each chapter in that book could be a short story make but they make up a larger whole yeah what yeah. was in boy's life already a film that's a well, different boy's life. The title might have been, but definitely not uh, the novel. Oh, oh, it has nothing to do with the novel. No, no. no. Uh, yeah, no, that's okay. a different boy's life. I'm okay. serious. Boy, a boy, boy's Life by Robert R. McCammon is one of the, I'd say, my top ten books ever. It's, it's yeah. great. And, and and back to what we were saying, Dan Simmons, The Terror, Summer of Night is in that same vein, and It, you know, to yeah. Kelly's what point, about, Summer of Night's great. Summer of Cali. Hmm? Song of Cali. I didn't get into his sci-fi stuff for some reason, and I'm I not sure why. That. Yeah, Song of Cali's not sci-fi. Oh, it's not. Is it more of a sex romance? I thought that fell into the Hyperion stories. That no. You did. Oh, okay. Is, isn't that well, Cali's horror? Isn't Cali a horror goddess? Yeah, isn't that thuggy like Temple yeah. of Doom? Yeah, it's down that t t down that path. No, well, maybe I need to give that a shot then. Yeah. I, I, every, every Dan Simmons book I have, Drood, and and I'm looking at all these other ones that I have that are all signed first editions. Be jelly, you guys. Um, I've loved, and so I, I really, yeah. If if somebody's telling me there's one that I haven't read that I will love, I should just pick it up. Is it so, modern? Is it set in modern day, or is it? Uh... Uh, it was set in modern day. Okay, it's been a while. Because I was okay, Cali was in the 1930s because that was the heyday of Cali fiction in the pulps. Okay, Payman, if I'm saying his name right, wants to know if we liked The Alienist. I, so far, excuse me, my wife and I have seen the first 
two episodes of The Alienist, and I do like it so far, but it, we haven't had a chance to view the remaining episodes yet. I know, Matt, you hate it. No so aliens. I no, I haven't seen the... Uh, There's just no aliens the in that book. So... Uh, okay, so we cover the terror. The Crossing is a new sci-fi show on, I can't remember where. ABC. Okay. Uh, I think only one episode is out as I speak. And I did like it. I didn't, I thought, okay, this looks kind of mediocre, but I love this theme, so I'm going to try it. You know, it's time travel, uh, or at least partial time travel theme. And then at the end of, it really surprised me at the end of the episode, and of course I won't say why. Have you seen it, Rick? No. Okay. Anyone here seen it? No. All right. No, I, I, I see they're comparing it to Lost. It's apparently made by the guys who made Lost. Well, hopefully they don't fuck it up like they fucked up Lost. I love that's, Lost. That's, that's the reason I'm not watching it, because I watch Lost religiously. And I still don't know what the heck completely was going on there. The, the problem with Lost is they didn't know what was going on. You know, it's, it, it's great when you get, when, you know, like two seasons later, you can look at something and go, oh, that's why they did that in season one. But these guys are right in Lost. They have no idea what the conclusion was. We, they, they had no idea what was really going on. They were just I, writing it. I still want to know what the heck was going on with the polar bears. I guarantee you that's how every television show goes. You don't know if you're getting a second season, much less a fifth season. But you must have I some don't idea. Every show, but you know, I do concede your point that a lot of them are. Yeah, but you know, you know, Straczynski's Babylon Five knew where it needed to go, where it wanted to go yeah. from the start. Straczynski was also involved in all five seasons, right? But right. the, the problem with Babylon Five is when he made the deal was for the uh, with Turner's network for the movies. He dragged it out. Rather than do the movies you want to see, he gave you peripheral stories you didn't care about. That's probably true. And he was waiting later to make you know more movies. He should have got you know. Early, well, he tried to make a sequel series uh, that well, I forget what that other one was. The Tales of the Whatever. No, no, no that t- Tales of the Rangers failed. There was that one about the plague on Earth. Oh yeah. Where it had the the Drac, the, uh, the successes to the shadows, put a plague on Earth. That's what all. That's where everything got lost. Because that only lasted like one season, and then they only finished it in the books. Well, I'm going to do everyone listening a huge favor and save six hours out of your life. There's a new... <laughs> Kelly knows what I'm going to say. There's a new show, new miniseries on Netflix, right? Netflix. Uh, called Requiem. It looks really, really interesting and haunting and gothic. And yes. It's got about two minutes of payoff at the end. You know, for Mike, six hours worth of watching. Sometimes, you know, Mike, the journey is what's important. Well, the no, journey was right. not worth. Did you see it, Pete? Yeah, I watched it, and the you know, was not worth it. And she's a very unlikable protagonist. On top of it, it could have been. It could have been cut down to three hours. You, you know, and, and there were there were there was a lot of red herrings and MacGuffins that just. Didn't need you didn't need to go there, yeah. And, and I mean, and there's, it, I think there's four yeah. episodes devoted to getting her, uh, what is it, her birth certificate. Well, probably. Did you think she was extremely unlikable? Yeah, I mean, and who the hell just moves into you know? I don't care what I don't care who you are. Who the hell just moves into some stranger's house? Yeah. I just don't get it. Rick, what were you going to say? I'm I sorry. I say it was probably better than the Twin Peaks remake. I gave up on Twin Peaks. I gave up on Twin you, Peaks. You, you're all right, too. It's good I don't know. I, I, look, I Twin love Peaks is difficult it, because there are absolute moments of brilliance throughout it. It's just that you got to slog through a lot. But, to get well, to I it. don't get answers to things 
you know, a show goes off the air. I want some, like, what the heck was going on with um, who's the female lead who was married to the short guy in this remake? Who was in the explosion at the end of the original Twin Peaks? You know who I mean? We had a. Oh, son. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're talking Sherilyn Fenn. Um, yeah, where was she? Sometimes Rick, never got the, any, the, the never journey got any. is more important than the destiny. <laughs> I've been waiting. But I've the journey waiting. Ha actually has to be worth it. I've yeah. been waiting decades for an answer to these questions. <laughs> when, and, when, and the first season ends without answering them. When I watched the original series and Julie Cruz took the stage she, and she sang, she had an impact on the characters and it moved the story along. I watched a 10 minute mu music video by Nine Inch Nails. The Nine by, Inch Nails. <laughs> followed by 20 minutes of free form sm burning smoke static that yeah. I, you know, okay, am I back to watching? Uh, Russian sci-fi again. So we'd um, like to extend the middle finger to Twin Peaks to Requiem. <laughs> Rush Patel says, "And what uh, about that movie last night?" Holy Mike? crap, Requiem! I'm I'm getting there. Holy crap, what Requiem pissed me off. I agree with everything Mike said. Obviously, a very wise viewer listener. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or or maybe not if you agree with anything I say. Um, yes, now. I would most like to extend the middle finger to the movie It Comes at Night. Do not watch this movie. I, I have to know with this kind of vitriolic statement how the um the easy night movie night went with with this movie. They you, you for the most part agreed with me. Yeah. Yeah. We if for those who don't know, every Saturday night at ten Eastern we've got a Lovecraft Easy and Movie Night on Rabbit. So if you want to be part of that, you know, email me, lovecrafteasyin at gmail.com and I'll I'll give you directions. But so uh, somebody suggested that we watch that and it didn't look good to me, but several people wanted to watch it and I was like, yeah, okay, well, let's watch it. This isn't just about me. Uh, we watched it and look, you can turn us off for the next two minutes if you don't want to hear this, if you want to decide for yourself. But that said, three, two, one, nothing fucking comes at night. Okay? Right. Nothing. Right. Nothing. You might as well have na named the movie Zebras Have Stripes because it would have exactly the same to do with whatever what happens in the story. Other than, yeah. other, than, other, than, other than a dog, nothing came at night. Well, the dog already lived there, so you can't even argue that. that. I know. It was a complete plot hole. Yeah. Jesus. So I kept, I kept expecting a ghoul or something to pop up. I thought that maybe that plague was turning, you know, it implied that it was turning you into some sort of walking dead type creature. We never saw that. Here's the problem. It could have it could be an could be an, a halfway decent movie. Um, because it's it's really more about you know, a couple of families reacting uh -oh. after the apocalypse, okay? And, it, it, you know, if it was marketed as such, I wouldn't be so pissed, you know? So, but it's not about anything that comes at night. I don't, I don't even know where that title comes from. Yeah, if the title was after the apocalypse, it would make more sense. Sure. It doesn't come at night. Am I right, folks? Huh? Huh? Okay. I won't tell you the joke Matt told during the movie. So but that was part of the movie. <laughs> that was that did happen in the movie. It did happen in the movie, yes. Uh all right, what else? Okay, yeah, all right. Some uh Kelly Young veered me away from Siren. Did you watch everything or just one episode? Oh, I thought there was only one episode out. Oh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I watched the first episode it's on Hulu, oh. right? No, it's on um, it's on some weird channel. Oh, it's on Hulu too. Oh, okay. 
that would right. be easier for me because I had to hunt this thing down. And I watched it because we read the exact same review where the person was saying this this movie is bonkers and it has all these horror elements. Right. Um, and also because I live in Washington State, I'm a sucker for any horror that's set in Washington State. This was sh- uh, sh- shot like a horror film and or like a horror series, I guess. Uh, it's it's mermaids, but it's mermaids, old school mermaids, you know, luring people to their deaths and and things like that. I thought there were a, a lot Not of things. Aerial, in other words, no, no. I thought there were a lot of things to like in it, but not enough to keep me coming back for episode two. Even um, it's very much a, uh, a a soap opera with some horror trappings, and and everything is a soap opera. I understand that Battlestar Galactica was a soap opera set in space, and every show we like is a soap opera because it follows the relationships of people as they deal with this stuff. The Walking Dead is a massive soap opera. But Small this bill. yeah, this absolutely feels like the young and the restless with horror elements. Okay. I'm not gonna watch that. Yeah, you, you can pass. You can all pass. What happened to Pete? Did you say something to piss Pete off, Kelly? Probably. Probably. Offended by my hand job statements. Now, what 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 is this? I'm not talking about the quote that you read, the review that you read before the show. But what was this other review on your page about a bulb in a movie in a movie being the proper wattage? Can you please go to your page and read this? This is hilarious. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I love I love the internet, <laughs> and it loves you. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. You know that you can go on to IMDb and you can um, report goofs in films. So, so you look up a film and there, there's a little link there that says goofs and yeah. stuff like that. And you click on it and people sure, it's the point out. Section, yeah. Section, so. yeah, they point out continuity goofs and everything. Uh, this one was for the Born Supremacy of 2004. Uh, this guy is a fucking hero. I don't use the word hero lightly either. This guy is a hero. Oh, he I agree. Writes, <laughs> I agree. In the opening minutes of the film, Bourne has his nightmare in Goa and goes to the bathroom. We hear the fluorescent lamp ballast choke, buzzing at 60 hertz. But if Bourne is in Goa, India, like the film says, then it should be buzzing at 50 hertz. <laughs> I was just like, wow, that is that is next level trolling. I love that guy. <laughs> I hope that guy never reads anything that I write or edit or <laughs> I I hope he reads everything that I do and just comments constantly on everything I've gotten wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh Rick wants to talk about a couple of things. Yeah, first of all, I've got uh, the plug P.S. Publishing's Curse of Yig and their illustrated Lovecraft series. Okay. Nice. And, and rereading this, I uh, decided to look up an obscure Lovecraftian fact that it was impossible for S.T. Joshi to find. It's not a criticism. It took me three hours to find this on the internet. In the story Horror of the Museums, you have a Cthulhu Mizzou story set in a wax museum. Now, besides wax museums, uh, besides wax statues of the great old ones, you have a lot of wax statues of regular murderers or murder victims. So you have Dr. Crippen, who was a famous murderer in Britain. You have Henri Landru, who's a famous murderer in France. And you have some woman with a throat cut named Madame Demers, who is very difficult to find on the internet. You have to be very persistent. But uh, she was a murder victim in 1895 in Canada, Montreal, Quebec. And just to give the brief history of the case, it was famous because the British, the largely British Canadian police force arrested her. Uh, she was French Canadian. He's more, list- he's more normally listed as Mrs. Demers than Madame Demers which is probably why 
Josie would not have been able to find her, and that was one of the reasons I I had to try some various combinations to find her. Uh, she was her husband, who was something of an alcoholic, had some arguments with her. Uh, said he saw her right before she went for he went to work in the morning. When he came back from uh, a neighbor, later found her in the afternoon uh, with a throat cut on the floor. Uh, the husband was arrested, even though there was at least one witness, there may, may even have been as many as three, which said they saw her alive through the window, neighbors saw her. So it was like, you know, why they said the, the police was uh, prejudiced against French Canadians for arresting him. But the reason why it probably interests Lovecraft is that one of the theories of the case which really has no basis is that the murderer was a member of an immigrant community that was made up of Syrian Arabs. And it was supposedly may have to do something with a dark ritual from Syria. Little bit of uh, horror at Red Hook there. But that was this prejudice. I'm putting two and two together. You've seen the Born Supremacy, right, Rick? No, I haven't. Oh, you haven't? Okay, well then, never mind. My theory is incorrect. <laughs> okay. The other thing I wanted to mention is that Moonstone Books has a new Cold Jack thriller out. Now, it's called Cold Jack Double Feature by Richard Masterson and Chuck Miller. Not to be confused with Kolchak double feature just by Chuck Miller. Showing that at least really? they should have had a numbering scheme here. Yeah. So you, if, if, you, if you want the book, I'm going to tell you right now, it has to be, Matheson has to be in the title. It really also should have William Nolan in the title. Uh, there was this third, you know, Kolchak before it became a TV series was uh, two movies, The Night Stalker and The Night Strangler. There was a third movie planned called The Night Killers, which would have had Kolchak working for a newspaper in Hawaii for the same editor he always had, Tony Vincenzo. And it would have been closer to the X-Files than the other two movies because it was going to involve UFOs, uh, a little bit like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, it would be humans getting replaced with robots, maybe a little too uh, conventional. The, uh, there was a screenplay by Richard Masterson and William Nolan. It is novelized by Chuck Miller as the first half of this book. And he throws it, or the novelization has some connections to uh, the episode was the invisible monster from space. Uh, I think the title was They Were... They are, they shall be. Right. Great episode. Yeah. So it's got connections there. That may be, uh, you know, introduced into the novelization rather than from the original novelization. But there is talk about, it's supposedly, it's supposedly the same aliens are behind this uh, invasion by basically they're using the LMD plot of uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Matheson uh, wrote. Both both movies, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. This one was apparently first written by William Nolan and then Matheson revised it. And now it's done as novelization. Um, it's interesting more, of, that story is interesting more from an historical perspective. It It's, uh, if you're interested in what Kyle Kolchak was playing, I would get this, but it's not a particularly great story full of cliches about alien invasions. Okay. The second half of the book, which is a little more interesting, is called The Night Chicago Died and is a Chuck Miller transition to Chicago because that was where the TV series was. So it tells you how Kolchak and Vincenzo ended up in Chicago. The monster is a mummy. Uh... There's a, some little interesting switches on uh, troves from mummy movies. 
hints at some incredibly unknown god in Egypt that can't be named, which sounds like a possible call out to Lovecraft's Nihilothotep. That was a better story than the first one. It's a story. Well, we watched two episodes of uh, The Night Stalker on Lovecraft Easy and Movie Night a couple of weeks ago, and my two favorites, and everyone seemed to enjoy it. I think we actually had people watching that had not seen those episodes. So, you know, what was, hey. inter what was, what was interesting about that was Horror uh, on the Heights, which was the second one. You, you showed the, uh, they, I may have the title a little wrong, but it's they were, they are, they shall be. Right. And you show the one, it deals with these Indian monsters called Rakasha. Right. There's a scene early on, it's all these murders in the uh, Jewish American community where he's interviewing three guys who are in a poker game. And one is a landlord played by an actor named Ned Glass. And you may not catch it, but he recognizes Kolchak because he was in the episode with the uh, Swamp Monster. Oh, okay. I'll look for that next time I watch it. He, 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 he says, oh, weren't you with the health department? Because, you know. Oh, I remember it. He's like, no, that, that was my brother. Yeah, of course, in the, the Swamp Monster episode, he impersonated a health. Uh, Isn't you health, with the health, the health department? Yeah. <laughs> I see, that's that's what it was. I wondered what that, I've always wondered about that. Okay. Yeah. I later caught that re rewatching him in reruns. I said, oh, that's why he said that. <laughs> Kelly, do you have something else? Yeah, this is a question for Rick because I'm sure he can answer it. So we, you mentioned that Richard Matheson wrote the uh, Night Stalker and the Night Strangler, but was that? I have a book here, The Night Stalker by Jeff Rice. Yeah. Did did and it says screenplay adapted by Richard Matheson. So did Jeff Rice write these novels that were turned into the movies, or how did that work? It gets a little more complicated. And then Jeff Rice wrote the original Night Stalker novel. That's the Night Stalker. Right. And he couldn't get it published. And I think he couldn't get it published because there was a novel, it was pretty much the same plot, except it was set in Washington, D.C. rather than Las Vegas, called Progeny of the Adder by Les Witten. Which the vampire had the whole thing was robbing blood banks. So probably Dan Curtis, since he... You know, what, what happens a lot of times, if you want to make a movie based on something that you can't afford it, you buy the book that's similar. So that's why I think they bought Jeff Rice's book. Jeff Rice then got the novel published, but he wrote it after Matheson did his screenplay. So there may be elements oh, interesting. that were introduced by Matheson that ended up in this book. Night Strangler is based on Matheson's screenplay. So okay, because then I see in here it says also published by Pocket Books by Jeff Rice is the Night Strangler. Yeah, but that's 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 totally that Matheson came up with the whole alchemist idea. That's totally Matheson. Interesting. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's what I wanted to know. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Do we have anything else? I think that's it. The most important thing I think today was about the uh, bulb. And the born supremacy. If you got nothing else out of today's podcast, probably that's what you need to remember. All right. Well, oh uh, yes, we've got a prize: the Ballad of Black Tom. Uh, thank you, Matt, by Victor Lavelle. Okay. Um, I just to say I haven't read that, but that ties into horror at Red Hook. Just to... oh, it's brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Um, so, my, you know, Mike will tell you the email. The email for the email. Right. I love I've got. Evening. Sorry, go ahead. I said I've got it on Kindle. I just haven't got around to reading it. Yeah, me too. Lovecraft easing prizes at gmail.com and put the ballad of Black Tom in the body of the email. In the subject of the email, tell me how and when you listen to the show. I'm always interested. Um, Lovecraft easing prizes at gmail.com. Uh, Victor Lavelle actually will be on the show in August. So we'll talk to him about the book then. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time.